My name is Susan Deutsch. I'm the program manager at the Muse Writer Center. We are a 501c literary nonprofit based in Norfolk, Virginia, and we provide creative writing classes, literary events such as this one, as well as a number of outreach programs for anyone who wants to learn how to write or learn how to improve their craft, all ages, all genres, and all experience levels. We also just released our new class schedule. Most of our classes start in February and March, so be sure to take a peek on our website, the-muse.org. And we'll go ahead and get into it. So tonight we have a book launch for Mike Krentz. And here with us is also Kelly Sokol, who will be introducing Mike. Uh, she's one of our teachers at the Muse. She teaches the Fiction Studio and is the author of the novel, The Unprotected. Go ahead and hand it over to Kelly. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Um, I am so thrilled to be here tonight and I, it's an honor and a pleasure to get to MC uh, Mike Prince's second book launch for this stunner of a novel, Angels Falling. Um, I've worked with Mike now for several years uh, through the Muse Writer Center in the fiction studio. And I am so fortunate that I've gotten to be an early reader um, for several of Mike's projects, including Angels Falling. Uh, we were just talking about it before the Zoom started, but Mike, I, it breaks my heart that your second book um, is also being launched in pandemic times and we can't um, gather together in person to celebrate you for the second time. Um, but I realized part of that is because you're just really prolific and you are publishing at a really fast rate that the rest of us can only aspire to, two books in two years. Um, but also here in Virginia Beach anyway, I am definitely hearing the unmistakable tinkle of some ice against my windows. So perhaps, you know, as usual, you were one step ahead of the rest of us for planning this virtual launch. Um, but I have to say, hopefully everybody else here will raise a glass with me um, in toasting this incredible novel um, and just a really tremendous human being who is part of our Muse community. And it's just this community, we're so fortunate to have people like, like Mike who are so active um, in our workshops, on our board, I, you know, it just across, across the spectrum of being involved, being committed to his classmates and to other people's burgeoning literary dreams. So Mike, I'm thrilled again to be here. So that everybody has a sense of how things will go. Um, Mike is an absolute pro. He's a great reader. So he's going to pick some wonderful selections to share with us tonight. Um, and then after that, we will field some questions and answers. And hopefully we'll get even more insight into how Angels Falling came to be. Pete, Maria, and the whole incredible cast of characters that I know have stuck with me um, since my first reading of an earlier draft of this story. But first, for those of you who are not acquainted with Mike Krentz, the writer of Angels Falling, I wanted to hit some highlights um, of Mike's bio. So that you know, um, Mike Krentz writes medical suspense and military fiction featuring complex characters. Definitely complex characters in the novel we'll be talking about tonight. His medical stories transport the reader into the stressful environment of emergency medicine where life battles death amid terrified screams, plaintive whimpers, and shouted orders. Where fallible humans strive to postpone death, restore life, or eliminate misery. These ardent heroes sometimes fail. No time to grieve. They suck it up and move on. To quiet a frightened child, relieve pain, straighten a broken limb, repair a laceration or reassure the worried well. What evil might lurk amid such chaos? Born and raised in Arizona, Mike Krentz earned a classical degree in English from the University of San Francisco, a doctor of medicine degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin, and a master of public health degree from Johns Hopkins University. Following a civilian career as an emergency physician, Mike rededicated his professional life to serve America's Navy and Marine Corps heroes and their families and to honor their sacrifices in defending our freedom and way of life. Serving in hospitals, ships, and air wings, he earned 10 personal decorations, including five awards of the Legion of Merit. His last active duty assignment as the seventh fleet surgeon on board the flagship USS Blue Ridge became the inspiration for his forthcoming Mahoney and Squire series. 
After retiring from the U.S. Navy, Dr. Krenz continued his service as a consultant supporting the Navy and Marine Corps Public Health Center. Upon completion of that mission, he returned to his earliest life passion as a full-time writer of character-based stories. And aren't we glad he did? Please let me welcome everybody, Ms. Dr. Mike Krentz. And the mic over to you. Well, th th thank you, Kelly. Uh, that was that was really wonderful. Uh, you, you, you could have just uh, summarized it and said Mike Krentz is still trying to figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. But uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to share my work with the, with the, the folks at the Muse. And I'm going to say right off the bat, uh, no sense in putting it off. I owe a lot to the Muse Writers Center. Uh, the reason I've gone from a wannabe published author to a published author, uh, I can attribute directly to my experience in the Muse, the support I got at the Muse, uh, the tremendous <clears throat> uh, input from uh, my fellow students and from really qualified uh, teachers like Kelly Sokol. So, so Kelly, thank you. Thank you for, for making all of this possible. Uh, and thank you, the Muse, for having me. Uh, we're going to move right on to the readings, I guess. And <clears throat> um, Angels Falling is a is a character based um, novel. Th there are three main characters whose lives intertwined decades prior to this uh, this current uh, event. And, and we're going to talk about a little bit about each of them uh, and, and do some readings that, that I hope illustrate who they are. Before we do that, I'm going to, I'm going to read the, the prologue, which is unusual, to say the least. Uh, I have no idea how I came up with it, but I did. And, and I can tell you that it's, it's written in a somewhat poetic style. Uh, you may recognize some of the uh, some of the phrases as having been lifted directly from giants of literature, and um, but I can also tell you there's some Easter eggs in there, and, and there's a lot of a lot of clues as to what this story is all about. So I will begin with the prologue to Angels Falling. Death is underrated. Thanatos. Where art thou? Ubi mortem. La muerte. Consummation devoutly to be wished. To peer deep into darkness. Perchance to dream. Dreams no mortal ever dared. Mierda. No death dreams out Herod life's nightmares. Hamlet, you sniveling dolt. No rub. Fact. Darkness there and nothing more. To be or not to be is not the question. No choice, no more. This mortal coil fetters my sorrow-laden soul. Dolorous I am. Imprisoned, defiled, abandoned, I beg for death. Demon dreaming? Forevermore. Life, be not proud. Slave to fate, chance, desperate beings. Bear the whips and scorns? No respite nor nepenthe. My shadow on the floor. Kill or die, that is the question. Live to kill, kill to die. Surcease of sorrow? Not. Death never kills me. My soul from out that shadow? Shall death die? Is there balm in Gilead? Nevermore. Okay, that's the prologue. <clears throat> so 
let's let's meet the villain. I, I often like to start a story with a villain. And this villain's name is Rule. And he's just murdered the Archbishop of Washington uh, in the sanctuary of, of his cathedral. So we'll read about Rule. Rule removed the bloody oil stain, <clears throat> excuse me, latex gloves and stepped back to admire his handiwork. Perfect. He swept his gaze around the sanctuary of St. Matthew's Cathedral and glanced toward the chapel of the holy angels and aloft to the right. After trading the dirty gloves for a fresh pair from the rollerboard case, he extracted a 14 inch statuette and placed it near his victim's head. He turned the statuette a few degrees so that it faced the dead man's heart. Satisfied, he retrieved his upper clothing from atop the altar, put on a black clerical vest over his blood-stained t-shirt, adjusted the Roman collar in front, donned a black suit coat over the vest, and placed a black fedora on his head. He paused at the feet of the dead archbishop, made an exaggerated sign of the cross in the air over the corpse, and spoke in a mocking voice, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. He grabbed the suitcase, made a last check for telltale clues, and left the cathedral by the side door he had jimmied open hours ago. He departed 40 minutes before the scheduled opening for Sunday morning mass. Yeah, that's rule. Not a pleasant character. Okay, so uh, the next brief readings will will highlight the three main characters uh, in the story itself, and we're going to start with Pete Sullivan, who's a former seminarian uh, who, and now an FBI profiler in Washington D.C. Pete Sullivan glanced at his smartwatch as he passed the six mile marker of the Marine Corps Marathon. Nine minutes, 38 seconds per mile. He needed to average nine minute miles or less to meet his goal of finishing in four hours or fewer. Don't push it, 20 miles to go. Pick up a few seconds each mile. Save energy for the sprint at the end. Pete opened and closed his hands in sync as he pushed his legs to speed up just a bit faster. He shifted his mind to the Queen soundtrack, rocking him via his phone to Bluetooth earbuds. His mind played along. If he had time to set up the playlist right, he would cross the finish line singing along with Freddie Mercury as champions and friends. As he neared the seven mile marker a few minutes later, a high pitched beep interrupted Queen's bicycle song in Pete's ears. Who could call him this early on a Sunday morning? His few friends knew that Pete would either be running in a race or training for one. He ignored the call. Seconds later, the beep came back. Pete shook it off, checked his watch at the seven mile marker. 924 pace, better. <clears throat> Another annoying beep in his ear, cramp. Without breaking stride, Pete pulled his phone from his handy pack, fanny pack and hit answer. What? He panted in the phone to into the phone to emphasize being bothered by the interruption. A somewhat familiar male voice answered, Pete Sullivan? Yeah, more panting. Tony Mason, FBI. Deflated, Pete breathed into the phone as he continued running, his pace slowing against his will. What do you want? You, how soon can you get to St. Matthew's Cathedral? Poor Pete, didn't get to finish the marathon. We're gonna talk now about uh, second main character, Maria. Maria Santos is her name. 
Maria took a relaxed pace as she strolled the half mile from the gym to her apartment near DuPont Circle. The fall air invigorated her body while the luxury of a full night's sleep and the afterglow of her Krav Maga workout sustained her spirit. With a full slate of patients scheduled the coming week in her growing psychology practice, she looked forward to a quiet day off to recharge her energies. She hoped a long afternoon nap would prevent the recent upturn in her chronic headaches. When she unlocked the front door to her apartment, a peculiar sensation washed over her, as if someone was with her. She shook it off. Not the first time her mind tricked her. She dropped her workout bag in her bedroom, threw her gym clothes into the hamper, and headed for the shower. <clears throat> After the shower, Maria stood in front of the mirror over the sink and dried her long black hair. She reached for her hairbrush, but her fingers closed on nothing. The brush was not in its usual spot on the counter, just to the right of the sink. That's odd, she said. She always put the brush in the exact same place. The phone rang in her bedroom. She answered it, holding back her still damp hair as she held the phone to her ear. Dr. Santos? Female voice, serious. Yes? This is Detective Louise Vandermark, Metro Police. A chill shot up Maria's spine. Did I do something I don't remember again? Her voice quivered. Okay. <clears throat> I'm lead investigator for a murder that took place this morning at St. Matthew's Cathedral. We'd like to retain your services as forensic psychologist to assist our investigation. Maria shook her head. <clears throat> I'm sorry, detective. I just can't. Personal request from Chief Markle. Game changer. Years ago, when both she and the chief of the Metro Police Department were younger and less established, his discretion over an unfortunate event had saved her career, if not her life. She owed him. Okay, she would have to reschedule her patients. When do you need me? Can you come to the cathedral now? So much for Maria's Quiet Sunday. And uh, the final, uh, if we're not too late on time, the final uh, character of the three main characters is uh, a man by the name of Gabriel. <clears throat> Awakened by a migraine headache, Father Gabriel, ba Gabriel Valentine arose in careful practiced moments, movements rather, to keep the pounding in his head from erupting into full-blown agony. In the bathroom, he swallowed his prescription medication with a full tumbler of water, then padded back to bed with a cold washcloth to cover his eyes. Laying on his back, he recited the Lord's Prayer in comfortable Latin. Pater noster quies in celis. 60 minutes later, as if to an alarm, Gabriel sat up in bed. A mild sense of nausea and vertigo as if on a boat in rolling seas, replaced the pain in his head. He arose and began his morning routine, following each meticulous step in a ritual that never varied. Kneel at the bedside, pray, morning toilet, seven minute shower time to the second, shave, clean and disinfect shower, tile, toilet, sink, mirror. Back in his bedroom, he put on fresh white underwear and t-shirt, pressed black trousers, black socks, and polished black shoes. Next, he donned his starch Roman collar and clean black cassock of the traditional full length cut with 33 buttons from collar to hem, symbols of Christ's years on earth. Each button took a second and a half to close, 49 seconds in all. Gabriel went outside and he's watching from the front door of the rectory as his 
flock begins to assemble. The single women emerged in single file through a door in the middle of their building. And it's parallel kind of dormitory-like buildings. Each woman wore a light blue full-length loose dress and modest white veil. Behind the first 11, the last woman shuffled along on her knees. An area of shaved scalp peeked out from beneath her veil. When she saw Gabriel looking at her, she bowed her head and scuffled the rest of the way with eyes fixed on the ground. From the mirror image building on Gabriel's right, the 12 young men emerged, each wearing navy blue trousers and long sleeved buttoned up white shirts. Skull caps topped their heads. They waited with silent respect for the women to pass, then fell into step behind them. The last man shuffled along on his knees, his skull cap revealing a shaved head. Without looking at Gabriel, he kept his gaze fixed on the ground as he moved along behind his fellows. No one spoke in keeping with Gabriel's mandate of absolute silence on Sunday mornings before mass. As he watched the man and woman trudging on their knees, he decided to release them after mass from their kneeling penance. He would show them loving mercy and also reinforce the lesson about the inviolable nature of his rule against singles fraternization. The slow regrowth of their hair would be a lingering reminder for several weeks. At precisely noon, verified by his watch and the clock on the wall, Father Gabriel Valentine, dressed in flowing Kelly green vestments, joined two 12-year-old altar boys at the church entrance for the procession down the center aisle to the sanctuary. Passing between the wooden pews, he counted those in attendance. 51 followers scattered among the pews for the Sunday mass, three missing the Chandlers and their rambunctious five-year-old daughter, Annabelle. Parents had seemed distant of late. Pay them a visit today. Gabriel stopped at the foot of the three steps to the altar, genuflected, and began the service with his back to the congregation. In Shorebo at Altarum Dei. The altar boys he'd personally trained responded in unison. Gabriel continued the mass using the ancient Latin rituals and movements passed down through prior centuries. He and his followers considered the modern Catholic liturgy, in his own words, a pedestrian abomination that reduces holy mass to nothing more than a Sunday brunch. After reciting the gospel in Latin, Gabriel mounted the pulpit, faced his followers, reread the gospel text in English, then launched into his sermon. He had timed it for 12 minutes, his standard length. He preached about the value of tradition, loyalty to the one true church, and the cult's commitment to activism against false prophets. Near the end of his talk, he scanned the faces in front of him. My brothers and sisters, in less than a week, the false Pope, the successor of the heretics, John and Paul, the pretender to the throne of St. Peter, will invade our land. How shall we, the true believers, react to this Antichrist in our midst? What witness must we proclaim for the one true church? And that's Gabriel. He's got a few issues. Uh, okay, Kelly, <laughs> over to you. Thanks for, for, thanks for indulging me on, on a fairly long reading. Oh, no, thanks, Mike. I just was sitting here thinking for me, and I think for so many of us who are participating tonight, those of us who love books, I mean, there's nothing like hearing an author read his own work in his own voice. And then also, you know, 
our opportunity to have access to the brain that created this story. And so I'm thrilled again that we are part of it and we really appreciate you giving us this sense of your multi point of view and multi, you know, multiple central characters in, in the book. Um, and which first I have to ask, I mean, I have, I have my copy because I pre-ordered it um, because I like to do that. Where can we get Angels Falling, Mike? Where can we find a copy of your book? Right now, uh, the only way to get it is from Amazon. Uh, it's available in both Kindle and uh, paperback. Uh, there, there's uh, a bit of, a, of an issue Y'all have heard about the supply chain problems. And uh, the major distributor of, of books in the country, a company by the name of Ingram, that distributes books to local bookstores like Prince Books, which is a fabulous resource, uh, hasn't got it yet. Hasn't got it available yet. And that's, that's not just a, a, a problem with my book. It's a problem with... Uh, several other authors uh, from my publisher and from other publishers. They just, uh, they just can't get the books distributed to, to local bookstores or even to Barnes & Noble uh, in a timely manner. So right now it's just available on Amazon. Will you keep us will, posted? I will, however, um, point out that the Dead Already, my first book, is at Prince Books, if anybody's very, interested in that. Very, very, very good, Mike. Um, and um, Hopefully you have seen in the chat function for those of you who are in the Zoom, um, Mike's website is has been posted. Um, and so you can certainly check there for um, breaking news about Angels Falling, Del Ready, and the several other books that Mike has um, in the publishing hopper. Uh, I, want to, I want to get to our first question and, and to remind everyone to please, if you have a question that you would like us to ask um, Mike Krentz, type it into the Q&A function um, so we can see it and we can make sure that your questions make it through. Uh, the first question we've received from Ruth Stevens, um, and the writer says, this seems like such a different book from Dead Already. I agree. Um, and she's wondering if you see yourself continuing in this direction as a writer or perhaps going back to medical and legal drama or maybe on to something else. Yeah, there is a story behind that. And, and the short answer is this is a standalone. Uh, it was conceived as a standalone. And uh, if there is uh, a, a second book in the series, it'll be different. Some of the characters might be the same, but it will, it will be different. Uh, and, and I can also tell you that uh, currently, my, my current work in progress is a sequel to Dead Already. Uh, which I've been workshopping in Kelly's studio and, and hope to get finally finished and submitted to my publisher soon, I hope. So uh, my mainstream uh, writing is, is really the medical fiction and also a, a series of uh, military fiction, character-based military fiction, not, not special forces, shoot them up, leave everybody dead kind of stuff, but, uh, but, but character-based. And, and, and that's really my, my sweet spot. Uh, one of the reasons I, I did this book uh, has to do with there was some ambiguity and some question uh, around Dead Already, uh, not the book itself, but the genre, medical thrillers. Uh, we were getting some, some feedback from, from fairly respected uh, literary agents and, and editors that uh, medical thrillers didn't really fly. Uh, because people could get so much of their, their medical fiction on TV shows. That turned out not to be true, but, but instead of moving immediately into another, uh, uh, the sequel to Dead Already, I thought I would try something different. And I, and I kind of was, uh, I was interested <clears throat> in the sort of gothic cult, uh, religion as cult kind of, thing and, and some, some uh, significant psychological syndromes that I've deliberately not mentioned because it would be spoilers to do so. Uh, and, and so it's really more of a psychological uh, piece of work, psychological fiction than the other. 
Well, Sorry, that um, long answer to a quick question. No, it's actually it's related to something that I have been wondering as well. When I look at the, the blurbs and the reviews um, of your book, Angels Falling, so far they're all incredibly positive. And one description really stood out to me. Um, best-selling author Jane Ann Krentz describes Angels Falling as neo-gothic. Um, which I think is is really fascinating. I would have probably called it a psychological thriller. Um, and I guess we can be more things, you know, than than just one. But do you feel this is an apt description? Um, and if so or not, why? First of all, I need to explain why Jane Ann Krentz and I have the same last name. Uh, it's because she's married to my cousin Frank, my older cousin. So uh, we are we are cousins by marriage, and, and Jane, who's a very 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 successful uh, New York Times bestselling author, has has been a mentor and supporter to to my work for oh, a decade or more now. Um, and, and she she actually kind of put me onto that that descriptor and it works because if you think of gothic novels, the, the, the more traditional ones, uh, the Castle of Otranto would, would be a kind of a primordial one, but there's others. Uh, many of the works by one of my favorite authors from the time I was uh, learning uh, English literature in high school, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a lot of Gothic stuff. And there's might've caught a, a couple of quotes from Poe in that prologue and, and there's others in the book. And it has to do with the feeling that it generates in the reader. It's sort of, it's, it's dark and it's, it's sinister and, and it's scary, uh, twisted, it involves things like secret rooms. There is one in, death, in Angels Falling, secret passageways. There's one of those too. Uh, corrupt clergy, yep, got that, uh, and and the sort of a sort of a supernatural overlay, and we have that as well. So I think it does fit uh, kind of the, the neo gothic uh, genre. Great example of which uh, is uh, Mexican Gothic, uh, came out a couple years ago. So we obviously as we discussed this is very, it's very different than your medical thrillers and your, your military novels. Can you give us some insight into kind of your wellspring of, of creative ideas? How do you, how do you do your writing work? What's your process? Well, uh, I, I don't do uh, outlines. I, I do a very rough outline and uh, because my stories are character based, and, and Kelly, you've seen this as, as uh, your studio has suffered through some of my early drafts. Uh, as the characters develop and as I write the characters, I get to know them better. And I like to say the characters tell me where the story is going. Well, that, that's not entirely true because they're, they're not real. Uh, if I, if I, you know, carry on a conversation uh, with my characters, uh, then perhaps I need some psychology, <laughs> psychological help. But it, it has to do with, I don't really get to know the depth and breadth of those characters until I start writing them. And then I realized that the initial concepts that I had uh, about what they were going to do to build the plot is, is not the way it should be. There's a better way to do it, and, and that's that's how I write. Uh, I know other people do extensive outlines, and maybe they go through that same process with an outline. I I, I know that, uh, for instance, James Patterson generates long outlines of his books when, when he writes his own books. Um, David Baldacci does a more of what I do, which is, and he handwrites his. It's it's a brief. Uh, synopsis outline, if you will, over several pages, which is what I do. Would you call yourself a planter? Then, planter, of... yeah, yeah, I'm a planter. The mm. hybrid between the plotter and the planter. Yeah. Very good. I think that there are, for as many writers as there are in the world, there are processes that fit, right? And I think definitely in our studio, you know, so many people take very different approaches, and I think every writer has to find what works best for, for themselves specifically, and then also I think for the, for the project. 
Susan Paxton uh, would like to know if you're willing to give us a sense of your background in Catholic history and rituals, because they are so sure. vivid in Angel's Talking. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to be a priest. And so I went to the Catholic seminary at the age of, oh, probably 14, 15, something like that. Stayed for seven years, decided I liked girls too much, got out. Uh, but uh, learned uh, an awful lot and, and uh, very, in a very positive sense. It was, it was a positive experience, albeit um, certainly an alternative lifestyle from what most uh, high school and young college students of, of my generation were doing. Uh, but I learned a lot of Latin, which uh, helped me learn other languages, uh, romance languages like Spanish. And, uh, I knew a lot about the, I learned a lot about the, the, the history and the traditions and, the, and the, uh, the rituals. So that's where I got it. It reads so inf informed and it is just, you very much place the reader in all of these settings, but then also in these rituals and in the place and in the sounds and the, the smells and the textures. And it really is, it's just this, that wonderful, verisimilitude we can just step right in to your characters and it's really it's a treat thank you something else that does actually run through running run through the two novels that we have um debuted online with with the muse um for you is the sport of running uh yep. we meet Pete sullivan in this novel uh about a third of the way through the marine corps marathon and I remember when I read this the first time that any runner knowing they had to stop at mile six, um, how frustrating that would have to be um, and knowing that so much of that race laid before him. Um, I'm wondering if running has influenced your creative process. It has, and, and I'd be interested in your take because I know you're, you're also a runner, uh, an ultra long distance runner that I've never, I've never done. Uh, I have run eight marathons, uh, earlier in my life. I, I did Marine Corps, uh, I think twice. So, so there was that familiarity with it. But I, I think there's something about running that um, puts you in a place where the only person that you have to worry about is you. Unless you're an elite runner, which I certainly never was, uh, you're not going to win this race. The best you can do is the best you can do. And isn't that true about writing too? I mean, who wouldn't want to be Stephen King or John Irving or J.K. Rowling? But we can all be the best we can be. And, and there's something about that, uh, particularly endurance, long distance running, uh, I'm sure you've experienced it where you reach a point in, in a marathon where uh, you desperately want to stop, but you don't let yourself stop. You keep going and you keep going. And, and that's, that's the way it is with writing too. Um, you keep going because you have to. Yeah. Because if you don't keep going, you're going to be you know, on a shrink's couch somewhere paying hundreds of dollars an hour. <laughs> so yes, I've always said running, running and writing are cheaper than psychotherapy. Yes. <laughs> you're a doctor, so you're telling us we can just use those as healthy replacements. So that, that's, that's great to hear. Um, and it's, a, it's that kind of one step after another, one word after another. I do think there's, there's a, a link there. And that I think what you're saying is so interesting that keeping going, even when in the moment, um, stopping would be easier. Do you, ha have you had moments like that in your writing career where you thought maybe you had kind of reached um, kind of as far as maybe you were going to go and, and considered not putting that next word on the page? I have uh, more than once, several times, many times. I, I think uh, most writers do uh, and the ones who succeed or the ones who keep keep going uh it's hard you, you know you're a writer it's hard it's hard work and uh, i think that without the support of 
uh, a network of fellow writers uh, such as such as the Muse uh, or or whatever support group you can you can come up with, uh, you, you can keep going. But yes, I've I've come close to quitting several times. I think that's just it's an important perspective when we're talking about. You know, this launch of your second book and that so often, you know, we, we all joke in studio about the, um, the overnight success, right? But that overnight success usually is the result of decades of, of work, but that's, those are private hours and personal time. Um, whereas the, you know, when you have the, the, the novel to show for it, that's the outward facing um, moment. Do you have advice for people who are maybe in that place? They're feeling frustrated by, their attempts at whether finding an agent or an agent selling a book or just kind of on the, on the business end of writing, what would your advice be? Go for a run. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be an actual run, uh, but I, I, I've gotten through uh, you know, plot blocks, writer's block, uh, doubts, uh, by, by, by uh, running or doing some other kind of healthy sort of thing. Um, it's okay to put the story away too for a while and work on something else. Uh, there, there's a, yeah, I believe there's a certain subconscious process that has to happen uh, and, and you can't rush it. Uh, so, so there comes a time when, when if, you, if you get kind of stuck and, and you're not sure where you want to go, maybe the best thing to do is set it aside, write something else, write a piece of nonfiction, a, a short story or something like that, and then eventually get back. Um, I, I, I end up doing that not necessarily voluntar voluntarily. Uh, I get sidetracked on marketing and, and that other stuff but uh, typically when I pick up a, a, a piece that I'm working on after it's sat dormant for a couple of weeks I'm in there I can, I can move again I can keep going so maybe you're saying set a story aside for a little while but keep the writing going and recognize oh, yeah. keep, keep, it keep, the, same keep the writing going for sure uh, don't quit you know, you know what I have, you know what you call a writer that never quits. No. Published. <laughs> well, we're thrilled that you haven't quit. Um, mm -hmm. I have one more question come in. I love it. It's very craft oriented, um, which makes me happy. Uh, so we noticed that particularly in Angels Falling, we have several central characters and they're all wildly different. Um, and you keep their voices their just their personalities, their mannerisms, their speech patterns, really nuanced and distinct. Um, how do you get to know your characters, and and how do you find those distinct voices and keep them that way while also braiding their storylines together to keep this tremendous narrative tension that really runs through your novels? So I, I've, I've actually taught a course on this at the news. I, I may teach it again as well about weaving multiple plot lines and multiple points of view. For me, it, it, it's a way to stay engaged in, in what I'm doing uh, because it's not just a linear single point of view, whatever, first person, third person, whatever, uh, plot driven kind of novel. Uh, for me, it, it's, it's it is about the characters. And I, maybe I'm a frustrated actor. I kind of like to play the roles of the characters. I mean, could you tell I kind of enjoyed being Gabriel as weird as he is? Uh, I, that's not me, but it's like I'm play acting. I'm, I'm an actor playing that role and it's kind of fun. So I guess, I guess that's how I do it. Well, you said when we were talking about your intro that, you know, you, you joked that you just, you're just finally figuring out what you want to be when you grow up. But isn't that one of the most beautiful things about writing fiction is that we have the opportunity to inhabit minds and experiences and, you know, imaginary, you know, bodies that we, we can try on so many different 
personalities and characters as writers and creatively that we don't always have to decide who we're going to be <laughs> and stick with it. I love it. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. When, when you really get into it, once you get past the, you know, the hard parts and there's plenty of hard parts, it's fun. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing right now than writing. Well, what a beautiful sentiment. And we're so thrilled again, as your readers, um, that you love to write and you keep, you keep it going. Um, wanted to just throw out there that if anybody has any final questions, you can type them into our Q and A. We'll give everybody a second. Um, and be sure to connect with Mike Krentz on um, his social media, on his webpage, um, a lot of those that information is available on Facebook, our Facebook Live, um, at the Muse Writer Center webpage, um, on our Zoom right now, um, and elsewhere. And thank you, everyone, um, so much for being here. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to give us this glimpse into this really compelling world that you've created in this novel. Well, it's, 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 been, it's been fun. Um, I have to share with you what my wife said about it when she read it. She said, you know, it's really scary sleeping to, next to somebody with that imagination. <laughs> and I took that as, as a huge compliment. Uh, but, but yeah, it was fun. And, and as, a, as I mentioned to uh, uh, an earlier question, it is probably a one-off. Uh, we're, we're getting back into uh, Zach Winston and Bridget Larson and a few of their other characters that uh, that I think that I think is going to be be a fun a fun book too. Uh, the uh, the other uh, two that I have coming out, uh, they're actually both at the publisher now. The manuscripts is is the first two of uh, of a four book series of character based uh, military fiction. Uh, the the first two uh, primarily feature uh, women in naval aviation. Uh, because those 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 folks are my heroes. Uh, after having uh, worked with them and uh, really immersed, I mean, you're on a navy ship. Your lives are immersed together. Yeah, you know? and, and and the things that they have to do just to, to succeed are tremendous. So, so those are two two books to be coming out sometime, and uh, and that and the sequel to Dead Already. Uh, coming out soon. So uh, it's, it's going to be enough to keep me off the street for probably another couple of years, I hope. That is so exciting. And I very much hope that as soon as the, our, your next uh, novel makes its way into the world, we can all gather in person to celebrate because I now have two books um, that I need signed. <laughs> the one time I've seen you in person that we were able to be in person, uh, I did not have your book with me. And so now I have to have a big book uh, signing when it is going to be safe so, someday. So I am, uh, I'm ahead of you because I have a signed copy of The Unprotected by Kevin <laughs> Silk. And, and, I, and I, I will also mention that I, I am currently reading a, uh, a pre-publication uh, review copy of, of Kelly's next book. Uh, the title is still, I guess, up in the air, um, but coming out uh, soon. And, and I'm, I'm totally into it. It's... Uh, it's a great story and, and fantastic characters. And I'm, I'm anxious to, to see it come out uh, for real so I can get you to sign it too. Well, thanks, Mike. I know it'll 2022, uh, I'll be quite that right the year. Um, are there any closing comments you'd like to leave your readers with tonight before we sign off? Yeah, keep, keep safe. Uh, we're, we're, li we're living in crazy times. And, yeah, and uh, it, it doesn't have to be as bad as it is, but uh, just stay safe, y'all, and, and uh, keep reading. Keep reading so that we can keep writing. <laughs> uh, and if you are a, if you are a, a, a wannabe writer, keep writing. Keep writing. And Slide. revising. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you so much. much on behalf of the Muse to I'm both sorry, Mike I have and one Kelly. Other thing. Uh, no, go for I'm, it. I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, if you really, if you really want to learn about writing and you want to have a great experience, go to the Muse. Check check out the uh, the spring schedule. 
there's something there for any anybody who wants to write anything. And I can tell you that it's time uh, and a little bit of money well spent. And I do mean a little bit of money. There are there are writers, companies, if you will, uh, that charge a heck of a lot more for less quality. So uh, check out the muse if you want to really succeed as a writer. You've also given me a great way to plug our scholarship program and our tuition assistance program. It's the top in the country for creative writing centers. So even if you can't afford to pay for a class, there's a way to take one with us. Um, thank you both so much for joining us for such a wonderful conversation. Mike, congrats again on Angels okay. Falling. We'll definitely keep an eye out for hopefully, hopefully they'll be able to stock it at Prince Books and all the other bookstores soon. Thank you to everyone who's joined us live tonight. And if you're watching this after the fact, thank you so much for watching. Again, our website is the-muse.org. And to everyone who is local and on the East Coast, please stay safe in this storm. I can hear it coming. Um, so please be careful, stay off the roads. And yeah. Stay home and right. Stay reading. healthy, stay home, stay right. Stay and right, stay creative. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, have a lovely night or whatever time of day it is for you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Mike. Good night. Good night.